We have switched things up. We moved to London. Across the pond, this is what they call it. Startup scene is really nice here. Don't get me started on the weird technical issues that you run into. The big topic uh, in the book community or the startup book community has been the Elon Musk book. I think Walter gets most things right. If you're a founder, what are lessons that you can take away from Elon? The first one is just he tries to push things to the absolute simplest. Elon Musk like makes a bunch of money, then bets it all, makes a bunch of money, bets it all. Always just willing to just go the full length. His ability to take risk is beyond what a lot of human beings are capable of. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. After a bit of a break to a new episode with Arthi and Sriram. As you can see, we have switched things up a little bit in ways big and small. The small is, well, we're testing out a new setup because we are in a new place which we're going to talk to. So we're trying this out where we're in different rooms, exactly just right underneath me. So if she kind of pokes up with like a big broomstick, I can hear it. But we thought we'll give this a shot. So tell us how we feel, what do you think? And we're going to run those in a few episodes. The big change and the reason why we have taken a break is we moved to london we are now in a different country can we cgi in a british flag i should hold the <laughs> held a uk flag before we did this but yeah this is uh shiram in my third country we you know we, we were born and brought up in india we moved to the u.s just as when we joined our first job and we stayed there for 16 years 17 years something like that and then now we decided to move to London. Sriram, why did we move to London? Well, uh, actually, for uh, something that I do at work, you know, I generally try not talk too much about what I do at work on this podcast. But the simple version of this is that I am here to head up all things for Addison Horowitz and crypto. Uh, we are opening up our very first international office here no pressure, in no the UK. All. Uh, yeah, and we have big plans for crypto here in the UK and the startup ecosystem, and I'm quite excited. So if you're watching this and if you're a founder, you're interested in UK startups or crypto, and you're here anywhere nearby, send me a DM, send me a note, but we're excited. So as a part of that, Aarti and I, with our kids mood across the pond is it what they call it the pond the pond the, yeah that's right um we've lived in silicon valley in san francisco for about 12 years now and you know we came in very early in our career and you know san francisco and the startup ecosystem has just been fantastic for us right like we've learned a lot we try very hard to pay it forward i you know i've started companies there uh, our careers and career velocity. We talked about career velocity in the previous episode. A lot of that happened when we were there. So we have a lot to be grateful for. London, you know, it's also a different time in our lives. Now we have kids. And so it's not like before when we moved from India to Seattle, we could just like take a backpack and a suitcase and just be there. Now with two small kids, it's a lot more difficult and it's a lot more involved. They like give to really think through implications. But for me, I'm I'm really excited because one, it's totally new. We wanted to do something different for a while. Two, you know, the startup scene is really nice here. Like you have a lot of like founders from Oxford, from Cambridge, from a lot of these universities nearby, really strong talent. London just seems to be this epicenter that is international, right? It attracts people from all over. And so we've met a lot of people from who are just so diverse. They're just from all over the world. That's been really nice. And we just wanted to give it a shot and see, like for me, I'm here because uh, I want to talk to founders here. I want to engage with people here building companies and see how I can be helpful and uh, hopefully learn a whole bunch here in the process. So I'm excited for that. It's been three weeks now and uh, we're just getting used to the whole setup. It's a little bit nostalgic too because, you know, we spent all our lives in, like in India, even little things like the metric system or saying flat versus apartment or lift versus elevator. And then we moved to the US and unlearned a whole bunch of that and learned the American ways of saying things. And now we're back in London and it's like, oh, that flat or oh, yeah. lift or it's the same like what we'd like. I, I, I don't know what the nostalgia is the word I would use. I would say it's, it's, it's been somewhat annoying because I felt like I spent years trying to train myself to, for example, start with the month and not with the day when you write a date, <laughs> say Z and not Z. And uh, it's funny because, uh, you know, I was in an event and I had to train myself to say A16Z 
and not A16Z because it was completely throwing people off when I said Z. And everywhere you fill out a form, you're writing the date with the day first. So it feels like we put in all this effort after many, many years, and now we kind of have to rewind uh, things back. And also, don't get me started on the weird technical issues that you run into when a bunch of online services now think that you're in a different country, uh, oh, yeah. watching TV, switching regions. Uh, there are tons of tiny things which I'm sure like expats uh, will resonate with. But on the other hand, there's been some amazing good stuff. First of all, the food. <laughs> We've been eating a lot of food. There's been a lot of food. Alien food, food. food specifically in London is just top notch. It's just like... You know, we we come from San Francisco, which has like really good restaurants and everything. But over here, it's like next level, I think. Uh, you know, at some point, we'll share restaurants once we've done a pretty deep survey of all the Indian restaurants. Exhaustive here. survey. <laughs> Exhaustive. Uh, yeah, food's been really good here. You will definitely hear more from us on All Things London and you'll definitely see more of it if you follow us on social media but it's been fun it's been an adventure it's not always been easy but we're excited and if you are here and want to meet up or hang out or you know or just say hi let us know okay all right so, what uh, the other thing is if you've done this not exactly san francisco to london but you basically moved countries tell us how it's been what you've learned and what like you know tell us like what you've done to adapt. I think one of the things I struggle with is time zone shift, right? My, you know, I work for a, my, a lot of my uh, employees, a lot of our, my team, everybody is like based in the US. And so my meetings start basically midday, like 1 p.m. or so. And then they go on until like midnight or 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. And it's been tough because, you know, it's also weird to have like your entire morning. No one like pings you because everyone's asleep in the U.S., and then your afternoon, things just like your phone just blows up. And I'm just not used to that at all. And then not being around in the evening or when like, you know, by like 8 or 9 p.m., you kind of want to take a break. You want to get some dinner. But that's when everybody's in full swing and just getting into meetings. Uh, it's a bit of a shift for me. So I'm still getting used to it. It's been a couple of weeks. But yeah, if you have any advice, any tips for how you've been able to navigate time zone shifts and country shifts, I'm all ears. I would love to hear from you. Yeah, yeah, uh, that is true. Okay, what do we have on the docket? So today is going to be a solo episode because we just want to test the setup and uh, and we want to kind of like give it a whirl before we get our guests in, at especially these new time zone differences. But so what are we talking about today? There, there's been a couple of things going on here, right? As you know, as people probably know by now, Sharam and I love books. We love reading. We miss all of our big collection back in San Francisco. We have over 3,000 books now, something like that. You know, now, right now, like it's especially this weekend, the big topic uh, in the book community or the startup book community has been the Elon Musk book. Um, you know, Walter Isaacson, who's got, you know, he's just had prolific access to you know amazing founders. He's written this book on Steve Jobs. Um, he's done the, some fantastic books in the past. And he wrote an Elon uh, biography. And uh, I've only started reading it. I picked it up today. Uh, but Sriram, I think you've like blitzed through it. Sriram's like a much faster reader than I am. So what are your thoughts? What do you think of the book? Well, a lot of people ask me this. And, uh, you know, it was definitely an interesting experience because... The few levels is the answer, I think. Right, one is I think you look at the book as just a piece of work in terms of how it is written, the work that Walter has done, and I think a few folks have tried to review that. I think you look at the book as sort of a picture of a particular founder, maybe one of the best iconic founders of our time, and maybe a judgment or an exploration of his personality and uh, all of his traits and characteristics. It's also a bunch of several incidents, uh, which have been, I think, very well covered in, in the press and in media. I think for me, obviously, the one which is most interesting was the one that I was involved in, which was the first few weeks and uh, months of Twitter. Uh, yeah. But I actually remember seeing Walter in the room uh, often in meetings. So I would say a few things. First off is, I think Walter gets most things right. And the way I calibrate that is, I think the way he covered the first few weeks and the initial period of time at Twitter. Yeah. How, uh, how is that different from what, I mean, you were there, you were there yeah. in these meetings, you were there in the room. Is it different? Is it the same? Is it perception? Uh, I, I think I was there for some of it and not there for others of it, but I obviously I've heard stories and, you know, from the people in the room. But the ones that, you know, I definitely, there was a couple of meetings which you described, which I was there. I remember seeing Walter there or I remember some of the conversations. I think it's more right than wrong. I think it kind of captures both the 
in the details, but also the directional sort of the thrust of how things were happening then. So if you kind of use that as a calibration for the rest of the book, I would say, um, you know, it seems mostly kind of a capture of Elon. Elon himself seems to think so from everything you read and hear. Uh, I think a few thoughts. The first one is, I think there's a bunch of things which we never knew. I think one is the exploration of his childhood, uh, his relationship with his father, obviously very intense, personal, seems to have been, seems to be a really formative uh, driving force for him. I think we had always heard hints of it, but never knew the details. And that, you know, even as somebody who maybe knows him a little bit, that was kind of news to me. And that was that was probably one of the most intense part of the book. And I think there's a whole question there and debate there about how much childhood shapes people. Uh, I think for me, uh, the interesting question for a lot of people here will be like, okay, if you're a founder, what are lessons that you can take away from mm-hmm. Elon? And it's a little bit hard for me to kind of divorce the book from my own observations. But I remember when my first few weeks at when Elon took over Twitter and I was there, I would come home every day and I would try and write down my impressions of what I saw because it was the very first time I actually got to see Elon up close and I wanted to kind of capture the imagery and the feeling of what you know what I was seeing. And it was obviously such a very unique time in internet history. And I would say I sort of crystallized things into a few themes of what makes Elon effective. And this is me as trying to calibrate him with some of the other founders I've seen up close, like Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey, you know, a few others. So I think the first ones, and I think this all comes through the book, but for me, this resonated as, oh, this is where he is really ahead or really emphasizes these things ahead of anyone else. So I think the first one is just the focus on first principles. And this is a phrase where I think it gets overused a lot. I think people toss it around, and I think even with Elon. But the way I understood first principles is he tries to push things to the absolute simplest and doesn't stop until he gets there. And one example... It's a good example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So one example of this is, I don't think this is the book, but in the first few days of TakeOver Twitter, you know, he was really focused on trying to get video uploads uh, longer video uploads on Twitter, now X. And of course, now that has happened, and now you can obviously upload multi-hour episodes or video uh, videos on X. And I know this conversation where, you know, we pulled in a few engineers and we're trying to figure out, okay, what is the maximum limit that you can upload? Because Twitter had the impost limit, but there was also right. a different limit imposed based on the technical implementations, right? And I don't forget the, the limit that one of the engineers in the room said was it was 42 minutes. And I, we all went like, okay, why is it 42 minutes? And... Nobody really knew the answer. We had to dig and dig. And the answer was like, you know, some combination of capacity planning, technical limitation, budgets, and a bunch of stuff in there. But what I really remember from that is that Elon didn't stop until he knew the exact answer to why was it 42 minutes? What will be the outcome if we change it? And he didn't stop there. So it was something about like, hey, I just want to get longer video uploads. Why is such an arbitrary number? And I've seen other variations of such meetings where somebody will just accept an answer saying, oh, it is going to be too much too much harder or it's too complicated, but Elon doesn't stop. And I saw this over and over again. So that's number one, just breaking things down into the absolute simplest possible terms. Even, for example, the other version I think about, other thing I'll talk, talk about is pricing when mm-hmm. Twitter verification went to a paid product and he picked the number you know, for $8 and he just said, look, if it's wrong, we'll fix it, right? So the focus on absolute simplicity, I think, was very core. The second part, and I think this hopefully this really shines through the book, is he spends the majority of his time with engineering talent and especially engineering talent who are on the front lines. Now, this is very different from how management style works at multiple other companies and some very effective managers. Uh, And in fact, in the book, there's a little sequence where Jeff Bezos actually thinks that Elon doesn't need to be in the details as much. But over and over again, I saw Elon get into the weeds with some engineer, usually somebody really young, and they would have a whiteboarding discussion about some technical detail. And I suspect for a lot of folks who are not in technology, who are covering Elon, don't really grasp this, that how much of his time, energy, and focus is spent on the engineering, the absolute lowest level details. And it's kind of a reminder uh, for me of like how engineering and computer science is at the heart of what we do. Because even as engineers like ourselves, over the years, uh, you kind of drift away from the core essence of that. But Elon just spends all of his time on engineering, talks to engineers, whiteboard stuff. Uh, he's involved in every engineering interview and he just really focused on engineering details. And there's a little bit of a wake up call for me. I'm like, oh, that's what that really takes. So that's number two. The third thing I would say, which is my takeaway, is that he just finds that most decisions 
can be turned back. Uh, if addition isn't blocked by the laws of physics, and he just thinks like, well, if it's wrong, we can switch it back. And there are multiple decisions where whether it was a pricing decision or whether some other role already was like, look, it's fine, we can switch it back. And I think that we forget that how many decisions can actually be two doors, two way doors as Bezos is and not one way doors. So yeah, those are kind of three things I think which really stuck out for me. Uh, the focus on first principles and simplicity, the focus on just engineering and spending a lot of time with just engineering talent, getting to the absolute front lines and the people working on the front lines. And third part is just making a call and running with it. And if you're wrong, screw it. You can always change it back. Those are kind of three things that stuck out for me. Why do you think Elon attracts these really good engineers, you know, these, these personalities who are just like very, very good at building things? You know, we've kind of consistently seen that over the years, right? They, when I think when uh, we visited SpaceX many, many years ago, we kind of saw that at play, which is really sharp, great engineering talent. I think uh, at Twitter, too, you said when you were there, he brought in his like set of engineers from, I think, SpaceX. Oh, it was uh, the Tesla. I think yes, it was the Tesla self-driving team. The self-driving team. And I remember you coming home and being like, these guys are really good. They're very, very smart. So what is it about? Is it his reputation as like having shipped, built these life-changing companies? Is, it, is that it? Or is there something about his personality? Like, what makes people want to go work for Elon? It's a good question. I think ability to hire engineering talent and top-tier engineering talent is one of his core skills, especially in our industry and his companies, which are so driven by engineering accomplishments. I think a few things. First is, it obviously helps that he's Elon Musk. His iconic nature, a lot of people who reach out to him are fans of his and they're starstruck. Uh, that absolutely really helps. Like he can call anybody and uh, and people are shocked when he gets on the phone. Then I think that can get him on a call with pretty much anyone and everyone. So that's number one. Uh, it really helps. I think number two is he picks problems which have strong engineering component in them, which are unsolved. There are some really challenging problems like, hey, you want to connect several hundred satellites in space and give high-speed internet? Or do you want to build a groundbreaking new AI company? Or do you want to you know, launch a rocket that comes back down to Earth and lands in the ocean? Whatever they may be, you know, these are really hard engineering problems and he picks them because he cares about them. And the best engineers want to work on really hard problems. So that's kind of a natural gravitational pull over there. I think the third part is that I think fantastic top tier engineers want to do great work and be in a place that where they're appreciated and understand uh, the, na uh, the nature of great work is understood. And I think mm -hmm. Elon appreciates great engineering work and mm -hmm. not maybe always great engineers. And, you know, there is a lot of incidents in the book and elsewhere where, you know, he can may not be the most caring human being when it comes to individuals, but mm -hmm. he does appreciate fantastic engineering work. And if you're a great engineer, you want to be in a place where you're doing great work and it's appreciated. And I think all of these together uh, makes it maybe one of the best recruiter of talent. Now, there's another interesting part where I think something which is underappreciated is how good he is at interviewing technical talent. I actually once asked him about this, where I was trying to figure out how does he actually interview talent, especially technical talent, because he does, I think, insist on doing most technical interviews himself. And if you look at his track record, he does seem to have an eye for spotting and getting great talent. The book, mm -hmm. I would say the book, there are all these stories where he plucks somebody from obscurity and they become great. Now, some of it, he has obviously observed in action and he can sort of use like, well, you're in the company, you do great work. But some of it is through an interview. And so I did ask him once where like, hey, what are you doing on interviews? And I think the pithy answer is that he just really focuses on getting them to explain a hard problem they have solved mm -hmm. and going into as much detail as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, that seems like easy. A lot of people do versions of that. But I think what is, again, underappreciated is that he's able to calibrate that with some of the top tier engineers he has seen. So he's seen hundreds of these answers with some of the best engineers in the world, and he's kind of encoded a lot of problems. So he's able to go deeper, and maybe there is he has special skills. But I do think he's an underappreciated interviewer of talent, as well as a higher recruiter and ability to kind of close technical. I, they, I think they go hand in hand. I also think, I think that's that's an awesome answer. You know, it's just, it makes sense, right? Like you need to be able to, one of the things that we know good founders have is the ability to recruit really strong people. Uh, because at some point you're going to be useless. Like you're going to have to like move on to other things as a founder, but you need a really strong team who can basically like build a company, scale it, grow it, you know, cater to the customers, all of that. I haven't read this book 
fully yet, but uh, I read the Ashley Vance version, mm-hmm. right? The Elon Musk biography. And uh, to me, the part that really stood out, and I remember, you know, I, I do this thing where I read half the book uh, on Kindle or paper copy, and then half the book, I try and do it during my runs as like an audio book. And the part that I was listening to during my run was uh, the SpaceX launch, right? Like the, the first uh, rocket in space and how many attempts it took and just trying over and over and over and over again and just persevering and not giving up. I also think maybe uh, one hypothesis is that kind of uh, mentality attracts these other founder type people who want to go work for him, where it's like you want to have somebody who will not give up no matter what, no matter what's getting thrown at you and just says the crazy thing, follows through and does the crazy thing. If you look at like, at least in that book, he talks about or um, Ashley Vance covers how Elon Musk like makes a bunch of money, then bets it all, makes a bunch of money, bets it all. And is like always just willing to just go the full length and uh, see things through. And I think it takes a certain personality and I can see why you know, really smart, talented, driven people are like, that's that's somebody I want to go work for. Yeah. And, uh, you know, want to go bet their careers on. Yeah. One thing I've been, by the way, I think I've been going to do from the book is uh, the book uh, gets into his obsession with polytopia, which I think he's talked about and tweeted about. So I've been trying to kind of play it and pick it up. You know, a lot of CEOs who do a lot of strategy games, Toby famously plays StarCraft, there are a few others. So this was one. Uh, I do think you're right. People are attracted to his all in nature. It's interesting because I think his ability to take risk is beyond what a lot of human beings are capable of, like Mm -hmm. many levels. I think financial, personal, reputational, physical, maybe uh, he he just has next level risk tolerance. I'm not sure whether it's good for everyone to have that. Uh, I'm not sure whether I could function that way, but I'm very happy he's out there doing this because, uh, you know, we just got Starlink in our new house and it wouldn't be possible. I mean, it's magic, right? Like, that's the thing. People, you can criticize Elon for a bunch of things. You can criticize for some tweet or some random thing. Like, you know, we've, we've, you know, I I promise you that, that when we publish this episode, there'll be a bunch of people being like, but he said that that's not cool. And oh, why are you guys like supporting him so much or whatever? But like, to me, it always comes down to, but look at the results, right? Like, mm-hmm. look at what he's been able to do. And you can't knock that. Like, you can't take that away from him, right? So to me, it just, it kind of comes down to that. And uh, you can't ever say that he's not fully dedicated to the causes, right? Yeah, I think so. the unresolved question, and this may be at the heart of why he maybe pisses a lot of people off is, and I don't have an answer to this, is... Does it take that personality in all the good and the bad to achieve those results? Yeah. And uh, and I think that's what a lot of people struggle with because the answer yeah. is you know uh, and you know if the answer is yes. You know, does it mean that you need to operate? You know, uh, he has this joke in SNL where he's like uh, his opening joke when he did the SNL monologue was, "Do you think I'll be just be a regular human being? Maybe you can't have a regular human being who's well rounded." polite on Twitter always and launch rockets and, you know, revolutionize the electric car industry and internet and all this other stuff. So I think that's a question which I think a lot of people struggle with. Anyway, yeah, it's a great, I, I think it's a great, I think it's a great book. Highly recommend people getting it. I think Walter is doing a great job. I will say Walter is had fantastic access. Uh, he was there in a lot of the meetings that I saw and not of the, a lot of the meetings were not even written about. So, you know, I can only imagine the volume of content that he had, which he actually chose to write about. So I think he did a great job here. What great timing to to pick up the, you know, to want to do a biography on Elon Musk and then the Twitter thing happened, right? Like he didn't plan for this. Uh-huh. So it was just like this perfect time capturing this like moment, this zeitgeist moment yeah. uh, to be able to like write this book. Off. I think there are a couple of these books coming out, right? One is Walter Isaacson, who just happened to have a two-year access, then this really thing happened. Though I think if you hang out with Elon for two years, interesting things happen. But I think <laughs> the more interesting version of this is going to come out, I don't know, maybe next year, is Michael Lewis hang out at the SBF during yes. the SBX explosion last yeah. year, which uh, very will probably be a very, very different book. But yeah. the book is fantastic. I, I think I highly recommend also watching Walter Isaacson podcast on Lex and a few others and Elon speaks about it. Highly, highly recommend it. Okay. Yeah. So we, one of the things we also want to do in this episode is try and take some audience questions. And uh, here's one, maybe we'll just do, do, do this one because we get this a lot. And this is Arthi, which is, do you need an MBA? And I assume this is somebody who's 
younger and you know maybe has an undergraduate degree but we get this a lot a lot especially from folks from india which is do you need a business school degree either if you're in the us you know think any top tier school gsp hbs etc one of the schools are from india as an iim one of the other schools but do you need a, a business uh, an mba what do you think this is kind of a, it goes deep right like it's a personal topic for me my most of my adult life my career i've always had this chip on my shoulder that i don't have an mba you know i uh, one i just got started working even before i graduated i didn't turn at tech like, intel and a few other companies and for me it was that was it like i knew what i wanted to go do and i just went for it and started getting a job and just it just became a thing right i no at no point did i have this chance in my life to be like now i should take a break now i should go do an mba kind of thing but it's a question that's kind of haunted me through a big chunk of my career where it's like i've always had this like chip on my shoulder that i am not probably as good enough as somebody who's got an mba and i say this because often times i would meet somebody or a peer of mine would be in the same meeting as me and they would be really well put you know they are they're very well articulating like you know the content and the presentation would be so great and you could see that you know they came from this background where they had training on how to communicate how to persuade and uh, just how to get your point across not to mention they also do good powerpoint decks mm-hmm. right like a very specific style of like powerpoint Wait, it, you always tell an mba student or is it somebody from a consultancy background because yeah, i feel like that's more too. consultant thing yeah sure consultancy too but you would see uh yeah you're right like dex i guess is more like a consultancy thing but mbas you know you would always find them like very being very strategic very businessy they would always focus on like the big picture and me you know i would always be like the the engineer the nerd in the room right like very unpolished always kind of like talking about it from a customer problem would really understand what i'm doing and what i'm building and i would be one of the few people who can go up and down the stack where i can like work with engineers do code reviews together all the way up to working with customers putting together like a plan a strategy on how we should go build stuff like all of that but i've always had this like i'm just not as good as these people kind of thing so it has bothered me for a big time it took me very long time to get over it now i'm at this point where i firmly believe that you don't need an mba and this has come through experience it has not come through you know some big aha moment it's like just years of just putting work through out there and being like i actually don't think you need an mba and i guess it depends on what you want to do but for my path i just don't think i needed it what do you think sharam is that too controversial well i have a similar chip on the shoulder i think you know like kind of being a bit removed from the time in our lives when you know we were needed an mba so i think yeah. you can kind of look at it a little bit more with an abstract nature now than when it was a little yeah. bit more of an option for us i guess yeah. so i think if you try and break down what an mba gives you i think there are three things one is you know there's obviously you know some sort of level of like educational content you learn things you know case studies or you know business management etc you're learning things so that's one mm-hmm. you know second is you're getting credentialing obviously you know if you're in a top tier school stanford gsb hbs uh in the us i am in india you know there is a credentialing aspect where it definitely has open doors uh and it gets you taken seriously mm-hmm. the third and i think this may be the most valuable aspect of it is the network that you build because if somebody is in one of these schools they are probably right. really good at what they do and it gives you a community that i've seen people really tap into where uh and the M- thing about mba is is that people often come from different domains and walks in life so you might meet somebody who goes on to a job in finance or government or totally different industry and that network can prove very valuable and i've seen those networks tend to be very valuable but i would say that's kind of the the steel man version i would say of you know what people wind up getting i think if you look at all of those i suspect that i have better ways to do that now number one on the content side i really think the best way i'm not a fan of general running a business uh advice i think if you actually it's interesting if you can think about the whole elon story that we talked about right the the lesson from all of that is there are people who are very good at what they do specifically and you learn on the job and you just apply intellectual horsepower to a problem and you learn how to do the thing and 
In a way, I think an MBA is sort of the opposite of that because you're learning about abstract things, which I believe, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to be very angry in the comments, though I'm not sure whether MBA people are going to hang out on YouTube comments, so we will see. But I don't think like an abstract education is going to be as helpful as just doing the thing itself. Um, yeah. uh, and I think that's, you know, and I've had a lot of conversations, many, 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 many people from B schools have done that. Second is on the credentialing aspect. I think that's still true. I think that's true for some set of schools. You know, if you go to Harvard, if you go to Stanford GSB, it is going to get your LinkedIn noticed more. I would posit, though, that there are many other credentials that matter more. You mm -hmm. be a director at a fang company. You, uh, you're an early stage employee at a well-known startup. And of course, if you're outside tech, there are many other ways where those credentials will matter just as much as an MBA also. And then finally, on the, the network aspect, right? I think there are just multiple, multiple ways to build strong networks that we've explored on this call, uh, uh, on this podcast that don't require to be in a classroom. I do think that MBAs do give one thing, which I haven't seen other alternatives for. for. It gives a place for people to figure out their lives, especially at the time they turn around 28, 27, 30, and you spend a couple of years and you have a time, time to, where you almost like, you almost have an excuse to take a couple of years off figure out what you want to do, and then pivot your career into something else. I haven't seen many organic ways where people have been able to pivot from, say, hey, I am a chemical engineer, and then I'm going to go become an, you know, a marketing manager at Procter & Gamble. And like MBA gives you that pivot, a culturally accepted pivot, right. which uh, I just don't think there are many other good ways to do right now. Now, the downside of that is if you already know what you want to do, I think it's a waste of time. Two years, very, very valuable time in your 20s. And so, for example, I talk to a lot of people who are like, hey, I want to do startups. I want to be in tech. And you know, I'm like, great, just do the thing. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I will end with my one of my favorite quotes from Warren Buffett. So which is if you want to, if you already know what you're going to do and you know, you're in your mid 20s, right, like don't wait for an MBA just go do the thing, like get the job in a fan company, go to the startup, you know, whatever it is you want to do. So which comes from Warren Buffett quote, which is like, don't save up sex for old age. Just do it <laughs> on that note. But yes. You know, the points that you mentioned, the three points that you mentioned, right? To me, I look at it from the vantage point of what do you want to do, right? For me, I've always wanted to be a founder. I re re realized, I remember feeling that way very, very early on, even through early college even, I guess. And uh, I've always wanted to go build a company. And for me, all these years later, like to your point, like if you look at those three things, one, go do it, go build the company. Like you don't have to get the experience. You won't get the business, the abstract business advice on how to build a company. I don't know if that's going to be valuable for you. Like you're going to learn a lot more on the job it's not going to be pretty. No startup is going to be easy. And so you're just going to learn a lot more on the job, even like one year of doing it and banging your head against the wall. Like for me, the first year, it was like drinking from this fire hose, right? It was like we were building, I was building out the website, building out the back end, the logistics part of it, but also trying to fundraise at the same time, trying to do like growth and marketing at the same time, these collaborations working on a product, then we'd have like our first set of customers. So I would sit down with the customers and then like iterate all of these in one day, right? Like over and over and over again. And you learn so much. Like I don't know if like any education, like an MBA is going to like get you there that fast. Maybe over time it would, but I, you just learn a lot faster. Um, you also learn these skills like hiring and firing people, which I don't think you can learn, uh, you know, do doing an MBA. Like especially... Most often, like, you know, now I advise a lot of founders, I invest in a lot of uh, companies, I angel invest. And one of the things that I consistently find first time founders do is they're afraid to fire people. Right. And uh, it's not easy. It's not fun. But you kind of have to do it. And, you know, you know, it's how it's going to happen. The person you're like about to fire is, probably knows it too. There is a way to do it. And you're just not going to learn that unless you just get through it and do it, right? Like, And so there are things like these which are awkward, uncomfortable, distressing even, that you're just not going to learn with doing, like, with this, like, getting this degree side of things. The network part, yes, sure, but I almost, you know, maybe it's just me. I kind of have this as, like, a badge of honor that 
I don't have to go through a class or a cohort to be friends with these people and have that as my network. Like, that's okay. Like, I think we've, you and I, we've spent a bunch of episodes just talking about how to network and we should do a dedicated episode on this. Networking is is kind of a skill that you have to keep investing in, right? It's There's no like, you've done it, you've checked a checkbox, you've now networked kind of thing. You're going to have to like keep at it. I think one of your friends told us this, right? It's kind of like filling a balloon with air, which has a hole in it. And it's constantly going to like leak air and you're going to have to like keep filling it. It's a bit like that where, you you know, you don't stop networking just because you get through MBA and you graduate that batch. You kind of have to like keep at it. And your cohort of people who you know will keep changing every few years or every few months. So none of these skills that you learn, I think is going to like, you're going to like really check a checkbox permanently with like getting an MBA. You can make yourself feel good about it. The counterpoint, I will have one practical example is, you know, one of the founders and companies I really admired and I'd cold emailed talking about the power of networking was Stitch Fix, right? Stitch Fix at the time was magical. I think they're the one of the fastest companies to get from like founding to IPO. And uh, I think all in it took five years or something crazy like that. And the founder, Katrina Lake, I'm a big fan of her. She started Stitch Fix as an MBA project, I think at GSB. And so she kind of like picked this up. So my counterpoint to what I've been saying all this time is there are sometimes these incredible founders who just have the grit and the hustle who will basically pick this up as like a project in their MBA time frame and be able to just like get, get out there and go build it and really scale it. And for them, it just comes together, right? Like they have the right network. They already know how to build a company. They want to build a company. They know how to scale it. All the skills and all the network and everything all comes together. And that to me is like this bull case where, you know, it just worked out. But would have somebody like Katrina started a company and been really successful without the MBA? Probably. But I would like to think that it accelerated her path uh, mm-hmm. because of like going through this thing. So but if you're going to be a founder, probably don't need it. But I guess it doesn't hurt if you have one and you've started a company through that. Uh, and it really depends on the career path that you're choosing, I think. I agree. Um, all right. Well, I think that's all the questions we had. I don't well, know. What, what do you want to do? I think we did this episode last time, the solo episode, and we got a ton of feedback and a ton of comments. And I think one of the questions was this. And so I think if there are things that you would like us to go talk about or dig in deeper, do a specific solo episode on, you know, we'd love to just take your comments and feedback and just go through it. So let us know. Let us know what you'd like us to go talk about. I think one person asked uh, us to like really detail. Like I think our episode was called Quit or Stay, which is like at what point, you know, you have to like leave your job and find a new one. How do you find a new one? And uh, we got a lot of great comments. I think one of the comments was you talk about networking. Can you go into detail about what does that mean? And I think we should do a separate episode on that because I think it's super valuable. It's the one thing that I wish I'd known early on. And so we should cover that. But if there are other topics that you'd like us to go cover, please. Yes. Let us know. And let us know how you think that you set up and also ideas and tips for London or moves. We are all game. But on that note, same times, same place, same bad channel. <laughs> and next time. See you, folks. See you.